Hey, Edith. Hey, Christy. You know, my grandma is 96 years old and still doesn't need glasses. Oh. She drinks straight from the bottle. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners from Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening has gotten very popular. And we've noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips. A fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Hi, hi everybody. This is Edith over here, and who's over there? It's me, Christy. Hey, Christy. What a surprise. (laughs) Here we are again, (laughs) talking about our gardens. Oh, hello to everybody who is a gardener out there or wants to be a gardener out there. And people who are not gardeners. We, We love everybody who listens. And to anybody who's a grandma out there. Uh oh. I feel that that's a segue. (laughs) <laughs> Edith, you became a grandma. I did become a grandma. Congratulations. Thank you so much. What's Thank different? Um, I, it's, it's hard to put a finger on it, but I mean, I have this little baby, tiny girl, and you just think about them a lot. Uh-huh. You know, that's all. It's it's just a really nice feeling. And then, you know, I know that I've reached this ripe old age, You know, which, by the way, we're going to talk about when is it ripe today? Yeah, when is it ripe? When is it? Now listen to this. I'm glad that they say ripe old age, not mushy old age. <laughs> you know? Or rotten old age. Exactly, because in the garden, <laughs> that's what happens, right? I <laughs> I've been thinking about stuff like that. Well, anyway, thank you very much. And to all the grandmas and grandpas out there, happy gardening to you as well. On September 1st, Edith. Did you know that the patron saint of gardening is celebrated? No. Now, some people might think that when you see a saint in a garden, it's most likely going to be St. Francis. Uh Uh-huh, to find what you've lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he has birds on his shoulders and he protects the animals and the birds. But the actual patron saint of gardening is an Irish monk named St. Fiacra, whose feast is celebrated in Ireland and on France on September 1st. Well, that's wonderful. I could I, use him. Uh, yeah, I did not know we had a patron saint of the, of the garden. I need some help. Yeah. Well, maybe someone will write in. If you tell us what your problems are, you know, we do have listeners that write in to us. That's right. Maybe they they'll give us help. advice as much as we give our advice. I mean, we don't know everything. We have made so many mistakes this year, past years, but we continue to learn, huh? Let's give a shout out to our garden party members, Edith. Why don't we do lawn chair lettuce? Yes, yeah, so a lawn chair lettuce member of our garden party is somebody who gives us five bucks a month to help support the podcast because they want to learn more about gardening and they get a laugh or two. So for that five bucks, you know, it's not like Christy and I run out and buy a cup of coffee and split it. No, we put it towards <laughs> operating costs, correct? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and also, you know what it is? It's a morale booster. Yeah. It shows us that people are out there and they care. It's like if you ever feel like you want to give us a tip. Yes, exactly. And what you will get in return besides um, the, our undying gratitude and mm-hmm. love mm-hmm. is that you will get seeds from our garden. Yeah, you can pick what seeds. And we mm-hmm. have hand curated them, which means that we have picked them off of our things, not our things, our plants. <laughs> <laughs> good to be specific once in a while, isn't it? Yeah, we should make sure we don't have things on the website. Yeah, no things. Uh, Anyway, uh, that's what we do. That's what we do if you are, if you become a lawn chair lettuce. Are we ready to talk about our gardens? Yes, we are ready. I'm ready. I think I'm ready anyway. Sure. Edith. Yes. Hit us. Tell us how your garden is doing this week. Okay. You remember on July 15th, I planted a yellow squash you, about the same time, planted a zucchini. Yeah. Well, I have a three-inch yellow squash on there. You win. You won the prize. Did I win a prize? I was going to be excited because I have a flower happening on my little zucchini plant, which I still don't know if it's a zucchini. I'm hoping it's mm. a zucchini. Mm. But you have a little yellow squash. So this means I can't give you my all my extra yellow squash anymore. Uh-oh. Yeah, really, because I'm going to oh, have a man. lot of them now. It also goes to show how close... Most of the time, uh, when on the back of the seed packet, when it says 45 days or whatever, 
if the weather serves, it's really close. Yeah. So if you're a person who writes down when you plant stuff, you can kind of keep your eye on that. And this is actually a good lesson for everybody this summer who said to me, oh, Christy, I'm too busy to plant a garden this year because I'm going to be gone in June. Mm. Mm -hmm. You planted that July 15th. That's right. That's right. You could have a second harvest of it. You're absolutely right. Good point, Christy. I threw uh, some radish. That's this is how I plant radishes now. I throw the seeds on the ground, which, which was so <laughs> successful the first time. And guess what? They're up. Just threw them on the ground, rake a little bit, and they're up. So I'm excited about that. What kind of radishes? Um, red, round. Oh, the round red and, and round. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, the fancy kind. Uh, I think they're called champion. Okay. Okay. Um, nothing fancy indeed. I froze cabbage, tomatoes, rhubarb. Um, I saw an assassin bug at work. I saw an assassin bug on the on the blossom inside of a cosmos flower. I saw him kill a bee. I saw it. Those are describe to everybody what those bugs look like, Edith. Well, they have like pincers. They're they're little, of course, like bugs, but they have these pincers, and what they do is they. They, like, stick the pincer in the other insect. They suck out the juices like a vampire. And then the poor little thing is laying there, a shell of it form herself. Literally. His internal organs gone. The garden is so violent sometimes, isn't it? Really it really is. I have it's seen. It's life and death. It is life and death. And I also figured out why I don't see them do that to my Japanese beetles. Because Japanese beetles have that hard shell. Mm. Maybe that's why. They do it to the bees huh. and other insects. So there's that. Are you? How are you feeling? Are you? Do you feel like you have a little? Are you, were you traumatized, Edith? Are you okay? No, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I, 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 you know what I do? I compartmentalize. <laughs> oh, good. Yes. Yeah. Just shove it in. I just Bury shoved it, it away. Deep in. Deep away. Yeah. Went to look at a sunflower. Got all happy. Oh, good. That's just how shallow I am. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And what about you? What's what's going on in your garden? Well, you know, Edith, how a couple weeks ago you said that you hated your garden? Yes. Well, I think this week my garden hates me. What's it doing? And I feel like if my garden had arms, it, they would be crossed. <laughs> and if my if my garden had like eyes and a nose, it would be looking down at me, like kind of sideways uh -huh. saying, uh -huh. um, where have you been, bitch? <laughs> oh, and if it had knees, they would be crossed. No one's getting in here. Yeah, she, yeah, I am not enough. fertile. You know, I just haven't had a chance to get out there very much. And oh. the good news, though, is the reason why is because I am back directing a play oh, with yeah. live actors preparing yeah. to present a wonderful play called The Lifespan of a Fact for our community in the middle of September at Curious Theater Company, so. Well, very good. So that's, you know, when you got to work, you got to work. Right? Oh, it's so wonderful. So so mm -hmm. great to be doing it. And of course, we're doing all, you know, COVID precautions and sure. it's all very safe. But it's just, I just think about last year when I was just puttering in the garden. Yeah. You know, like you pull a weed. Oh, here's a weed here. I'm going to putter here. I'm going to, oh, look, this little cucumber is ready today. Yeah. And I have. Now you're under a time crunch. It's a whole different deal. Yeah, it's kind of rough. I walked, I did a little tour today with a cup of coffee to just kind of see how everything was. And, you know, there are weeds out there, Edith, that are taller than me. In your garden, Christy? Yeah. That's so not like you. You know, the, the lanthus trees are getting really big that I always have to pull. I saw a thistle weed that was, that went up to my knee that Ooh. was past bloom. Ooh. I saw um, creeping bellflower in bloom in my garden. Oh, gosh. I have to yeah. admit, I have a couple of those, too, behind where I can't get at them. They're but, sneaky that way. You took around, all of a sudden, boom, they're blooming. They're very smart. And people think plants aren't smart. They have a consciousness, and they are smart. Yeah, and they like to, I think creeping bellflowers know that if they go oh, by this plant, they look like that plant. So. I, yep. They look a little bit like echinacea, I think, when they're coming up. Uh -huh. So they're all around my echinacea. So that's very discouraging. And then, of course, I have so much to deadhead that I have these flowers that are blooming. I have my um, agastakis blooming. My Chinese aster is blooming. But it's surrounded by a lot of other plants and perennials and annuals that have 
the perennials are either done, so they're mm-hmm. brown, or they're, it's an annual that just needs to be deadheaded. So mm-hmm. that the plant that is blooming and looks beautiful can't really shine because it's surrounded by a bunch of stuff like old poppies and echinacea that has to be deadheaded and... Christy, you, you, your face is not right at this moment. You <laughs> look so pressured. You don't don't let don't let it. It's, it's okay. It's okay. I You're suppose. not killing will anything. You, then will you talk to the forsythia plant that I have out in the that front you that have I haven't planted, planted yet? Because mm-hmm. I walk by it every day. I go out the back door. I put it there on purpose so I can make sure it's. I will water it, but it just it looks sad. Now I know we say, if you make a mistake. The it, garden will forgive mm-hmm. you. Unless it's dead. But <laughs> right now, it hasn't. I don't think the garden has gone to the forgiving part. Oh. You know, you have to go through the stages of the garden is a little is a little ticked off. Yeah, it's it's pouting. It, it's what it's doing. It's pouting. <laughs> yeah, it mm-hmm. is. It's totally pouting. And I really, I don't blame it at all. Well, okay. You know what else? Remember last week we talked about um, Beyond Pete? Yes. That be- some folks... Um, are trying to not use peat because it is a source that is it's not a renewable source. We're running out of it. There's a lot in Canada. So people in the United States are okay, but in Europe, they are extremely encouraged not to use peat. Mm-hmm. But once we run out, we're out. Yeah. So I got this product called Beyond Peat, and I wanted to ask them what was in it because they said they used residual garden products and, and we were going ground up squirrel what, what the, the heck? heck is that yes so there's no phone number you you can't call them which drives me crazy so i emailed them from their website and they simply didn't respond christy what's that about hmm, are we you gonna, know what they're what? afraid of you edith they oh. know. They've heard about you, and they go, oh, no. Oh, no. You're like, you remember when, like, 60 Minutes used to show up, and people go, oh, no, Mike Wallace, and they'd run the other direction? <laughs> yes, lock that. the doors, lock the doors, <laughs> close the curtains on the windows. <laughs> Edith White is on the is on the trail. Now, I did tell them, I said, uh, I said, you know, uh, I'm part of a podcast. I did tell them that, because mm-hmm. I like to be upfront about things. 60 Minutes is very upfront. Have you noticed that? They'll yeah. go, hello, it's Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes, and as though he's not recognized. Is he still alive? Uh, no. Uh, okay. Sorry, Mike. I really liked you. I liked Schofield, too. Still hot. Dead, but still hot. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> what about Mike Wallace? Do you think Mike Wallace hot, was hot? Intellectually hot. Y- oh, yes. yes. There's a whole different way of being hot. Yes. Anyway, anyway, Christy, I'm still waiting, and if I don't hear from them by Monday, I will email them again. It's just weird not to respond to your customers. Well, I can't wait to see where this goes, Edith, because we need to find out what is in Beyond Pete. I really want to know. I mean, as a gardener and just as a person, it's I'm curious. Well, the only other thing that I've been doing, let me just, in the garden, I've been collecting a lot of seeds. Did I, uh, did I already say that? You didn't. And will you come, will you walk through my garden and collect my seeds too? Maybe. Depends on how hot it is outside. There are a lot of cosmos that need to be collected, and I know you love collecting cosmos seeds. I have so many cosmos <laughs> seeds, yes. And I, yesterday I started collecting morning glories. They're already ready. So if you're a seed collector out there, now's the time to look around. If you, uh, th- But if you deadhead everything, remember you won't get seeds. Right? You right. won't get you seeds. You won't get seeds. Oh, can I tell you a story? Please. This is a shout out to our friend John who loves sunflowers. Uh huh. He's also a member of the garden party. So yes. thanks to John. And he asked me, um, he asked me two questions about sunflowers. And one is um, when he brings them inside yeah. and to enjoy them, you know, a sunflower, the pollen will fall off. Yes. And he wants to know, should what he, should he do with that pollen? Should he gather it and throw it back outside for the bees? Oh my gosh. What an interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. Let's think about that. Then the other question he had about sunflowers was that he said, how come you never told me that if you leave the sunflowers on there and they, and the heads get old and dry, that that's how you get sunflower seeds. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm glad then that I said something about the deadheading business. Yeah. Yeah. Because it took me a while to learn these things too. Right. Oh, that's so, that's so cute, John. You're cute. <laughs> and hot.
Well, folks, if you ever hear terms or words you're not familiar with, please go to our website at UpsideDownTulips.com and check out the Upside Down Tulips Dictionary. You won't be sorry. You can also click on the link in our show notes. Don't forget to see what we've got on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, or on our YouTube channel. And now, here's a brand new pod play just for the gardener, inspired by Christie's Roma tomato plant named Cindy Brady. One morning, Edith and I were in my garden seeing what needed to be done when suddenly... Ma'am and ma'am, both ma'ams, slowly put down the coffee cups and put your hands in the air. What? Who are you? Buff Biffins, Special Victims Unit, Plant Homicide Division. Plant Homicide? What? Before we knew it, we were handcuffed and in the back seat of the squad car and off we went. We found ourselves in an interrogation room of the Plant Homicide Division. Buff Biffin sat across from us, staring at us accusingly. For the record, state your name. Edith Weiss, innocent bystander in Christie's garden. Edith, what are you doing? I can't let you take me down, Christie. I wouldn't last a day in jail. Look at me. I have a pretty mouth. Oh my gourd. Jail? Name, please. Christie Montour Larson. Christy Montour Larceny, more like it. Christy, what did you do? Nothing. Larceny and murder. Don't try to deny it. You threw Cindy Brady, celebrity tomato, in the trash. Oh, that. Yes, I did. Did you expect me to bury her in the compost? She wasn't even dead? You would have buried her alive? How can you be so cold-hearted? Why didn't you just deny it, Christy? Follow the lead of politicians and famous people always deny because i'm not a liar no but you're worse christy montour murderer be prepared for the special victims unit plant homicide division to throw the book at you we're in big trouble well christy is anyway tune in for part two to find out what happens next So now we're going to talk about one of the greatest mysteries of the garden. Something that's really important for you to know. Is it ripe? Yes. When do you pick your stuff? When is the best time? Well, it's different for a lot of things, right? Where shall we start, Christy? How about squash? Okay, squash. Let's start with summer squash. The game squash. Would you like to go play some squash? No, okay, okay. We're in the weeds, we're in the weeds, we're in the weeds. Okay, Christy. How do you know when a zucchini is ripe? Is it ripe at any time? Yes. Oh my gosh, I thought so. I really think it's ripe at any time. I know people who will not eat it if it's longer than three inches because that is at its most tender. So I don't know if the same goes for yellow squash. I bef- because a little a little zucchini is as green as it's going to get. I right? think it's true for yellow squash too. Is it? In fact, that also actually might be true for a lot of vegetables that it's could true be ripe for at any so, time. So many vegetables. That that's exactly right. So, well, could, as we go through, we'll let you know, folks. Yeah, we'll let you know. Indeed, we will. So, um, we've covered summer squash. Woo! Moving on to winter squash. This one is a little more. Um, this one's a little more difficult. This is, we're talking acorn, butternut, delicata, spaghetti squash curry squash, which is what I have this year. And if and if you pick it too soon, you don't want to pick it too soon, right? Because sometimes they ripen off the vine, sometimes they don't. So, But as long as it's connected to the vine, it's going to keep growing and getting yes. the right qualities that you want in the squash. So look at your plant, and if the leaves are dry and dying and dead, if the stem is looks dry and brown, chances are that it is ripe and ready to go. What about color? Color can make a difference too, right? In some, Yes, color makes a huge difference. So spaghetti squash have to be yellow. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're doing um, my curry squash, when, it, when it's little, is bright yellow. It's so beautiful. It turns a deep, deep red. Wow. Oh, it's, it's oh incredible. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's really Oh, I want to see that. Now, pumpkin is a winter squash, right, Edith? Yes, and so that would be also true with pumpkin, that it would, would turn the right color and the h- hook of it. Mm-hmm. I think, yes. Because you remember that I, last week I shared that my, which I thought was a spaghetti squash yes. growing in my compost bin. I was 
so happy to discover that it is a, a pumpkin. Oh, oh, good, yes. So tell me about this pumpkin, Edith. This pumpkin. Is this pumpkin ripe? No, it's, it's so not. green. It's green, isn't it, right? Yes. So why do I have it here right now? I don't know. Because look at the bottom. Oh, <gasps> who did that? It's it, all chewed up. A all squirrel? chewed up. Oh, this looks like a squirrel. Oh, this no. pumpkin is so cute. Oh, I was so, so excited. Pretty. Oh, I'm sorry. Darn it. But I do have another pumpkin out there that is turning, that is orange. It's all orange. Any way you can put a cloche or something on him? I, do I need to leave it on or can I take it off? That I really don't know. I would not. It's all orange. It's all the color that oh, I like. Oh, it is all orange. It's all orange. Yeah. What's the stem look like? I'll have to, it's green. It looks kind of green. Because that's important. And what do the leaves look like? The leaves on the pumpkin. Yeah, uh -huh. it's still, it still has a lot of life to it. I don't know. If I were you, I would cover it and, and leave it on for more for a week or two. I really would. Okay. And just hope a squirrel doesn't get to it. And Yeah, but can't you cover it with something? Can you protect it? No. Is that okay? It doesn't matter. It doesn't need the sun. Well, a, I'm, I was thinking of something that... Oh, like that a closure, like a... Yes, that yes. light can go through. Like, some, like if I had like a little... Like made a little thing of like chicken wire or something. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, a, something like that. I got to get on it, man, because I am... This is... See, my garden is mad at me. Oh. My garden is not happy. Oh, that's that's just so too squirrel. bad. And when you do... I noticed that you have a lot of stem on it, and that... Rem leave as much stem as possible... On your winter squash. And remember that I think this is how our forefathers, a long time ago, how they got through a winter. It's because this stuff, when you when you pick it, a lot of these things last for months. My curry squash lasts for a year. Hmm. You put it in a, wow. cool, a cool place, you know, yeah. 50 to 65 degrees. I don't have a cold cellar, but I have a room. I have a butternut squash you gave me months ago, if that still looks good. Yeah, it's going to be fine. And that, that I harvested almost a year ago. So, yeah. So that is what you do with the winter squash. Moving on to tomatoes. Tomatoes, it's pretty obvious, right? Color. Yeah, color. And texture, if it's hard. Mm -hmm. However, Christy, as you and I both know, and we both do this, you can bring in a tomato, either with just a blush of color yeah. And put it on your counter. You can bring it in hard and green, wrap it up, put it in your attic and forget about it forever. Yeah. It is best, though, when they develop on the vine. Yes, it is. It is the best when they develop on the vine. I was trying to tease you, but you didn't catch that. Oh. I said, when you bring a tomato in and put it in the attic and leave it there forever. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry that I reminded you of that. Of that thing you did, but yes, that you know why, Edith? Why? I, you know why I didn't hear you? Why? Because I compartmentalized it. Oh, very I, good. I took it, I squished it, I pushed it way down okay. as a memory that I would never ever have to consider again I, because I will of the never, pain. I will never bring it up because again. of the pain. I swear of, of putting up about fifty tomatoes in the attic uh -huh. and then forgetting about them for mm -hmm. ten months. Sorry. <laughs> don't we? Don't don't we have some kind of a. a Attic tomato um, category. Yes, as as, and, a, as the garden party. And that's, the what attic tomato. that's what it Ugh, comes from. And every time we say it, the pain, the pain. <laughs> so um, anyway, and, tomatoes and you, are easy, right? They are. If you can leave them on the vine for as long as you can. Now, what I usually do, though, is I pull them when they're about 90% mm -hmm. because of the squirrels. I do that, too, based on your advice. That's what I do, too, now. Now, I have so many tomatoes out there right now. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, my question is, isn't, is it ripe? My yeah. question is, what do I do with all these tomatoes? Or why aren't the squirrels eating them and leaving your pumpkins alone now that you have so many darn tomatoes? It's a great year for tomatoes. I have a bunch that I need to do something with. So yeah, my question isn't, it? my question isn't, is it ripe? And my question is, can you guys just wait a little bit so I can yeah. have a day yep. off so have I can time. deal with you? Oh yeah. All right. Uh, peppers are similar in the same way. Mm-hmm. When to harvest peppers, uh, they are mature and ready when they um, are full size but still green. If you leave them on the vine longer, they will change color to whatever their uh, type is. You know, orange, mm -hmm. red, yellow, brown, depending on the variety. But it's okay. It's okay to eat them green. Yeah. So if something is eating your peppers, and don't wait for them to turn color. Pick them, eat them. They will be just fine. 
if it's a cayenne pepper, you want to wait until they're bright red. Mm-hmm. I just harvested some bright red ones. Oh, nice. You know, I sew them together and hang them in my kitchen. That's so pretty. That's so pretty. Yeah. The the longer you leave them on, the more hot they'll get. The sun makes them hot. That is the correct. The hot peppers left to change will get hotter. Jalapenos, I leave them on until they get that dark. They have like a darkness to them. Yes. And they also get that, that like little white... Like the skin is breaking a little bit. They, they get little white stripes on them, a jalapeno pepper will. That's yeah. a good time to do it, too. Yeah, I leave them on as long as I can. And um, good good to wait for this time of year, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's almost pepper season. It is indeed. On my plant, my eggplant out there, I have four eggplants on there. Nice, Yeah. It can be tricky to know when to harvest an eggplant because if you pick them when they're over mature, they'll be, they get a little bitter. And they're spongy. And they get seedy. Yeah. So, um, and this is also good when you're in the grocery store, by the way, just trying to know mm-hmm. if this is a good eggplant or not. The stem and the cap of the egg, it should have a stem and a, and a cap on it in the grocery store too. It should be bright green. And okay. the skin should be deep and dark. And slightly elastic. So if you hold the eggplant in your hand and you give it a little squeeze, if the indentations remain where your fingers were, it isn't ripe yet. Oh, that's a very good... That's so it good. should bounce back a little bit. It should it be should bouncy. Bounce, if it doesn't bounce back, it's not ripe. It's not ripe. Okay. So I have a couple good. up there that I should bring in this weekend. You know, another general rule is um, if we're moving on to cucumbers now... Sure. If you look at the back of your seed packet and it says six to eight inch, don't let it get bigger than that because then it is going into the overripe territory yeah. and it will be yellow, bitter, spongy, mm-hmm. awful seedy. And wasn't that a story from one of your, uh, didn't you have, when, yes, when you were younger, you yes. had, you were supposed to. My professor's garden, I was supposed to be taking care of it. And I waited until the cucumbers were nice and bright yellow to pick them <laughs> I gotta say, yeah. this year I've had a lot of yellow cucumbers out there. I, a, they hide, I think. If they hide, they do hide, and it's a great cucumber year. Great cucumber year. I don't know. I guess I've been okay. Uh-huh. But, but but you know, a cucumber is, I think, something that you can harvest at any size. I agree. You can harvest just them like at a any zucchini. Size. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's like a free wheeling vegetable, and that's what we like. Hey, let's find out what's going on with Buff Biffin's Plant Detective. Okay. Be prepared for the Special Victims Unit Plant Homicide Division to throw the book at you. He actually threw the book at us. Listen, Detective Plant Homicide Biffins. Uh, Plant Homicide Detective Biffins. Listen, Plant Homicide Detective Biffins. You must be new to the gardening unit. Uh, Yes, it's my first day. I just transferred from loitering and jaywalking. Then let me explain. You see, by removing a sick tomato plant, I was saving all the other plants. Poor Cindy had some sort of fungus, which could have spread to all the tomatoes. So I had to do what I did. You're saying it was a mercy killing? I don't think I would use the word killing. Plant homicide detective Biffins. Star Wars or Star Trek? (laughs) Star Trek, of course. Then you've heard the needs of the many. (gasps) Mr. Spock, his dying words to Kirk. Don't grieve, Admiral, it is logical. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. (laughs) Here's a Kleenex. I'm not crying, you're crying. We're both crying. That was a beautiful scene, and I'm grieving for Cindy Brady. But it had to be done. I get it. You can go. Go on. Get out. Uh, Leave the tissues. Edith, how did you know he was into science fiction? It was the book he threw at us, Christy. The Star Trek Encyclopedia. Good thinking. And I forgive you for throwing me under the bus. I knew you would. The Garden... And Christy Montour Larceny Murderer will always forgive you. Edith, this year you're growing corn, right? For the first time, yes. Is it ripe? Yes. (laughs) Yes, I (laughs) ate the first one yesterday. 
And I had to Google, so I was absolutely sure, because it's not that obvious when it's ripe to someone who doesn't know like me. So you have to wait until 20, about 20 days after the first silk appears. If you don't count the days like me, then wait until it's brown. You, it, you'll see it, it has to be a good size, like, like a corn on the cob should be. Pull back the husk. Then take your fingernail and poke one of the little kernels. And if it comes out milky, it's ready. If it comes out clear, not ready. If it's dry, you've left it on way too long. You know who else knows that? Who? Squirrels. <gasps> Squirrels. I've done that before where, where I've had corn and I go, oh, yeah, it's ready. Tomorrow's the day I'm going to go out and harvest all this corn. Yeah. Squirrels Squirrels know when it's ripe. So they go out there and they take it off the the stalk? Yes. Oh, They'll my take, goodness. Yes. Well, I, I only, I was thinking I was just going to harvest as I went, you know, like one or two a day, but because they careful. say, but they, yeah. okay, I will have my eyes looking out for that. Yeah. And the traditional rule is that uh, when you're, a, when you, um, you should get a pot of water boiling to cook the corn and then go out and pick it. Because, because it's so good. Right then and there. Right then and there. Absolutely. Also, sometimes, I guess sometimes you can, if the conditions are right, you can get two ears of corn on one stalk. I have a couple of stalks that have two ears of corn on them. Oh, that's great. Isn't that great? Oh, that's wonderful. That's in my moon garden, you know. Good. That's in my moon garden. My moon garden's doing well. All right, Christy, cantaloupe and honeydew. Yes. Honeydew. When the cracks circle the stem and the stem itself looks shriveled, the, the melon should be ready to pick. So there's cracks around and the stem itself looks shriveled. Like always, this almost always the stem should be shriveled and old looking on all of these things. And then also color. Um, the color, it changes to a deep, pretty green. Mm. So right now, mine, are, mine don't have any color. So I know that they're not ready. Um, what about cantaloupe? My cantaloupe don't have that nice orange color right now. You know, they have, they look like they're in a web. They got uh-huh. that webbing around them. Yeah. But they're gray looking. They're gray and whitish. So we have to wait until they're more of a tan or, or an orange color. And can you tell by smell also, Edith? Supposedly you can, but I have not laid down and stuck my face <laughs> in it yet. <laughs> And again, look for a crack in the stem where it attaches to the fruit. The fruit could be easy to separate, too. Mm. And then you'll kind of know. Um, now, melon, these melons will soften after harvesting. Mine did last year. Remember, I lost Yeah. I, but the, they don't get sweeter. The sweetness is when it's on the vine. But you can pull them, and they will continue mm-hmm. to ripen without getting sweeter. So don't be despairing if you take them off a little early. Is there something with um, honeydew and cantaloupe that's similar to a watermelon? Because they say where it sits on the ground, if it's white or green, it's not ready. But when it starts to turn a little yellow, the spot that it touches the ground. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. And then the rind will get a little tougher. So that when you put your thumbnail, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you see how easy it dents? I forgot about that. That goes for winter squash too. When you when you take your thumbnail, you should not be able to peel any of that rind off. Mm. It should be really hard. Oh, thanks for reminding me about that. You know, I put all of my melons on uh, on pieces of cardboard so the bugs can't get them. Oh. Sometimes the bugs will come up and start chewing at them. Yeah. So that's what I do. Oh, you're so. smart. One of the easiest vegetables to harvest are green beans. Green bees and, and peas. And peas. Both of them. And, and both of them are kind of similar, huh? In when yeah, you know. I think you should pick them. They're supposed to pick them when they're a little bit shy of their maximum size on the seed packet. You, and this is also, I think, something that you can pick really when it's any time, when it's pretty Absolutely. tiny. Absolutely. Absolutely. With a pea, I mean, they can get too tiny to actually, so it's like eating pea dust. <laughs> so you don't really want to pick them too early. But if you wait, the seeds get hard yeah. and the pod becomes tough. And just a couple of weeks ago, I harvested a bunch of green beans and um, we got them all ready to go. And you could just tell when we were eating them, we were just like, your face turns like they were just chewy and Did you, did, were they lumpy good. instead of smooth? 
on the edge. If they're a little bit yeah. lumpy, if you can see the outline of the seed or if you can see the outline of the peas really well in the pod, that you've let them go a bit. Yeah, long. I thought I was on the edge with yeah. them. You know, I thought, oh, maybe they'll be okay. Yeah. And I think if they get to that point, I would pull them and let them dry out, and you can use those seeds. Exactly. For next year. Exactly. Then you have seeds um, for next year. And make year. sure, though, you harvest them, though, because depending on the variety of green beans you have, because the plant will keep producing more beans, but it won't, it'll flower. It might, green beans are still flowering, but it won't keep flowering if it knows it's going to seed. Yeah. It'll stop flowering. It will. So encourage uh, encourage the vine to keep flowering and producing pods by pulling them, even if they are overripe. Yeah. Very good advice. What about broccoli and cauliflower? The heads need to be super tight and harvest. That's the issue that I've often made the mistake of is harvesting them too late. And you're, you're talking about uh, broccoli, right? And cauliflower. And cauliflower. And cabbage. Same sort of family. Well, I harvested a cabbage and not five days later, it has six little baby cabbages growing on it. Because if you leave mm-hmm. the root and leave part mm-hmm. of that bottom stem, you're going to get more cabbage. Same is true with... Broccoli. Yes. I've been harvesting my broccoli all summer. The first heads, it went to seed so quickly. I was just shocked. Mm -hmm. So I've just been cutting out the heads, but then you can get the little baby heads. And and I'm still shocked about how much, if I think if I keep these plants going until the fall, I might get some really nice broccoli again. Because that second second harvest is really tender. Now, I don't have a single cauliflower head this year. I've got four plants, not one single head. Did you get any? I didn't even plant cauliflower Um, this year because um, I winter sowed the seeds and had great success. They came up. I was very excited. uh I put them in the ground and I did something ate it. And now I think I know what ate it is the little bunny that's living in my yard. Okay. So I'm going to have to get some cloches for the spring. And Edith, if I'm remembering this right, didn't you have trouble with your cauliflower last year? No, no, no. Last year they were wonderful. You know what? You may have to wait and see what happens. You mean don't pull them out and just don't, wait because we have yeah, some time yet. You've got time. And I seem to recall you saying this last year. <gasps> I'm starting to remember this. I think I was really complaining about this last year. And I let it, I waited and it came. Unlike Godot. Ha ha ha. Sorry, guys. Theater joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shall we move on to carrots? Yeah. Carrots, like root vegetables, huh? Yeah, root vegetables. Carrots, beets, turnips, your favorite turnips. I cannot imagine. <laughs> I do have uh, parsnips, which I adore. Uh, I radishes. cannot imagine. Radishes. I love radishes. But I can't imagine picking them too soon. That yeah. they w- that it, it's fine. But you want to get the maxima out of it. Look at the parts sticking up out of the ground, right? Mm-hmm. And if it's, I mean, if you let a carrot in there too long, it can get gigantic. Yeah. And, and woody. And woody, yes. Yeah. If you leave it there to overwinter, sometimes bugs get at it. Sometimes I'll miss a carrot and, you know, next spring. And it will be woody, so you don't want to do that. It's fairly obvious, actually. When they're popping out of the ground and they're the, kind of the size that you see at the grocery store, mm-hmm. they never have to be as big as what you see at the grocery store. Um, time to dig them up. Yeah. And uh, and Edith, how do you harvest a baby carrot? How do you know when a baby carrot is ripe? There's no such thing as a baby <laughs> carrot that they sell in the store. You know that, don't you? They put them in a machine and they just shave them around until they look like baby carrots. They call them baby carrots. Uh, it's annoying. I'm, I'm going to really complain about uh, grocery stores next week. Potatoes. How do you know? I mean, there they are in the ground. How do you know they're ripe? They take a long time. Uh, 10 to 12 weeks after planting, they'll come into flower. You kind of have to go in there a little bit, don't you? And pull. Make sure the vine has died back. Yes. First of all, make sure all of that stuff is died back, just like your onions, garlic, died back, brown. And that you make a, make a note about where they were. Yes, make a note. Because I've done that. Stick stick a f- victory flag in there and then dig up and see if they're ready. That's all you can do. Yeah. And they're not going to be like a big Idaho baker. No. They're going to be smaller. They're like the size of... A quarter. Mine were the size of a quarter. <laughs> I'm not planting them ever again. <laughs> oh, a, an egg would be okay. An we egg, could egg, egg size would, would be just great. fine. 
Mm -mm. Well, Christy, I look at that. We have covered our list. Yeah, and I, you know, I think my issue is never is it ripe. My issue is often the opposite, which is is it not ripe? Is it what? too ripe? Is it, oh, 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 oh. Okay, yeah, absolutely. But I have, but sometimes I get a fear of harvesting. Don't be afraid. I get afraid of thinking like, well, it should be bigger. Is this the right time? Uh huh. All that. Yeah. Better, better to be brave, folks. Mm hmm. Get it on a little on the early side. Always. Or better. taste it. That's a good guide too. Yeah, you don't usually plant one of something. So <laughs> <laughs> one of something. <laughs> one carrot seed. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, now let's go and deal with all these tomatoes. Okie dokie. Christy. Eat it. Do you know what time it is? What time is it? Mailbag. Ring, ring. Ring, ring. A unique mailbag to this week, everybody, because this didn't come from our postal carrier or through Gmail. This came through an exchange on Facebook from Holly in Colorado Springs. She had a picture of her uh, harvest all ready to go on Facebook, and she says, This is what happens when you ignore your garden and spend your time at the theater. Chaos and green beans. Oh, I'm so embarrassed that I neglected my seeds in their time of need. <laughs> Notice, making a rhyme in a time sublime. Time spelled T-H-Y-M-E. Good one, Holly. I need immediate upside-down help about late blight in my tomatoes and potatoes. Oh, no. We pulled the first tomato plant with symptoms, but it was all through the potatoes by then. We're just trying to limp through the summer and get as much fruit as possible off the plants. We don't have the heart to burn the whole garden down. I'm going to see how to treat the soil either this fall or in the spring so we don't have this issue next year. I listen to all your shows. Amazing work, by the way. Keep meaning to join the garden party. Mm. Holly. Oh, I feel so bad for Holly. This is the same blight that caused the Irish famine. This is a bad one. This is a really bad one. I mean, if you think about something that can get from a tomato that's up above the ground and into the potato that's under the ground, that's a sneaky blight. Yes. What's the difference between a late blight and an early blight, Christy? Well, both of them um, are spread by a fungal spore that's carried by insects, wind, water, animals, and that gets in the soil. So it's not, yeah, not your fault, Holly, not your fault at all. The disease requires some kind of moisture. So if there's rain or dew that comes in contact with a the spore, then they reproduce. So when it rains, it, the water hits the ground, splashes the soil up, and the spores hit the leaves, and there you go. Mm-hmm. If it's early blight, this will show up when the first fruits appear on tomato plants, and they will be have like they'll start with like a small brown lesion on the bottom leaves, and as they grow, they'll get a little target on them. The leaves will turn yellow and die and fall off the plant. Mm -hmm. Not the end of the world for early blight because it doesn't affect the fruits, mm -hmm. and the worst that will happen is that you'll have the loss of like protective foliage yeah. and shade. But but late blight, that's a whole different story, huh? Yeah. The symptoms on late blight is that it shows starts up on the edge of the tomato leaves with dark, damaged plant tissue that spreads right into the stem. Very quickly, too. So, so fast yes. this blight goes. And if left untreated, it spreads right to the fruits. Mm-hmm. And there's almost nothing you can treat it with. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing really that you can try fungicide. And if you th are thinking of doing that, call your extension, your agricultural extension, because you can do more harm than good with a fungicide if it's not the right one. Yes, uh, we, of course, would encourage you to do to try to find an organic fungicide. There mm -hmm. are several that are out there. Um, you, a copper-based fungicide every seven days, so you will need to really stay on it. Because organic solutions will take more applications than an inorganic solution um, if you catch it early. If you catch it early. Honestly, the success rate is not huge. Yeah. Holly did the honest. right thing, didn't she? She took the plant out. She did the absolute right thing. And, uh, and burning it is also the right thing. Now, Holly, this blight cannot stay alive in your soil. Only if you leave a potato in the soil that has the blight 
that's how it will spread next year. So next year, I would move these plants to a different area of your yard. Absolutely. I would also recommend going to a hybrid tomato. Go to a hybrid. Make sure that the bottom leaves take off the bottom leaves mm-hmm. so they're not, not so easily easily splashed with water when you water. Try a soaker hose. Try because soaker even hose. if yeah. you are watering by hand right there, they're still, you're still going to get a little splash up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, good luck, Holly. Boy, yeah, there's just some things that we don't have control over. That's all. Thanks for writing to us, Holly. And folks, if you have questions, garden stories, successes, failures, questions about tomatoes, about is it ripe? Anything like that. How do you keep squirrels away from your pumpkins? You wouldn't believe how much we love hearing from you. We really do, even if we don't have the full knowledge or answer. So write to us, please, at upside down tulips at Gmail or our website at UpsideDownTulips.com or check out the show notes. I'm in the mood to hear something important and profound. Christy looks like she's ready to speak up about it. Christy. This week's inspiration comes from Russell Page. If you wish to make anything grow, you must understand it and understand it in a very real sense. Green thumbs are a fact and a mystery only to the unpracticed. But green thumbs are the extension of a verdant heart. Oh, (laughs) verdant heart. How nice. (laughs) That's really nice. Thank you, Russell Page. And thank you, listeners, for listening. We are Edith Weiss and Christy Montour Larson. Would you do us a favor, please? Would you hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you listen to our podcasts? Thanks so much to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. For more from music, go to denisegentilini.com or find that link at our very own UpsideDownTulips.com. Thanks to our talented and kind friend, Luke Sorge. And thank you to our excellent and enigmatic engineer who prefers to be shrouded in mystery and will probably cut this. Oh, please don't. And a special thanks to our local nursery and friend of the show, Southwest Gardens. Join us next week, everybody, for your September garden. You're going to love it. Now, don't forget, if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Ta da! Upside down. Congratulations, Grandma. Aw, thank you.